Welcome back, you guys. This is week 44 of Our Mothers Knew It. And this week, we're heading into new ground. This is Mormon. So we're going to go from Mormon 1 through Mormon 6 this week. And I should warn you up front, this is a hard week of study. Mormon's life is hard, especially this coming-of-age story that you read in this week. We're going to go from seeing him at age 10 through when he dies at 74, or almost, like we'll almost get to the end of his story by this week. You see the Hill Cumorah battle by the end of this week's chapters. And it's hard. It's a hard life where he is this giant celestial heart that lives in a very dark telestial world. And it's hard to study. What's good about it, though, is it's so applicable to our day. Not because our world is as dark as his was, but simply because what he chooses to do in his life on a daily basis to come to the Lord and to continually see his people with hope and optimism and to continually reach out to the people around him, that kind of example is something we need. I just find myself sort of almost resisting reading it because it's hard. It's almost like the pumpkins on my doorstep. I, my kids always want to carve pumpkins early and I wait until the last possible second because I know as soon as we carve those pumpkins, they're going to just start to wither. There's nothing I can do at that point. They're just on this trajectory of sadness. And within a couple days, there'll be this little shrivelly mess that I have to chuck down the hill. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about these chapters. You almost hate to read this end. But if you watch for Mormon's story throughout it, what he teaches you about how to hold fast to the iron rod, what he teaches you about how to hold on to hope when no hope is around him, there is something that will pull your heart in. Despite all the hard and the, the sorrow that you'll read this week, there are these bright flashes of light and they come from Mormon and you just have to study him. Especially since so much of his words were written directly to us, I think the least we can do is honor his story, read it from beginning to end, understand who he was and how he became this mighty man of God. And you can get a lot of it in this week. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. Time to get into our nine things. All right, you guys, if you're new around here, let me tell you basically how I break this down. I'm just going to highlight nine things that I loved about this week's study. And I'm going to teach them to you in three different ways. The first three are sparks then we'll do questions, and then we'll do object lessons. So if you've never listened to this course before, my hope with the Sparks is just to inspire you to get into your scriptures. I'm just trying to show you things I saw that piqued my curiosity, that made me dive deeper into the verses, little nudges that I got from the Spirit to dig deeper. I often try to tie those to the last general conference message or the last couple so that you can kind of see how the messages from conference tie in to come follow me. So I call those sparks. Next, we'll do three questions. I think most promptings for me come from having good questions in my mind or hearing questions of others or trying to respond to questions. So questions I think are a really powerful teaching tool. So I'm going to give you three to sort of spark some ideas in your mind. Then I'll do a second video of three object lessons. My hope with the object lessons is always that you will find simple and memorable ways to help the rising generation. This is a week that is all about how strong the rising generation can be. Mormon is the poster child for the rising generation. So this is a good week to get their interest and object lessons are how I do that. So you'll see all that coming in these next videos. But since I can't teach you everything that you're going to find in these verses, I thought I would give you just a quick summary of what you find chapter by chapter. So when you start in Mormon 1, this is Mormon kind of rewinding the clock and telling us who he was when he began, when he was this 10-year-old kid who was found by a man named Amaron. Amaron seems to just observe him. Almost like we saw with Rebecca in the Old Testament. He observes how Mormon interacts with the world around him, and he calls him quick to observe and a sober child. And so Amaron, who's looking for someone to be the next record keeper, someone who will watch over the plates that have been buried because the wars are so bad, he spots this 10-year-old Mormon and calls him to the work. But he tells him that he's not going to access the plates for a while. He's got about 14 years to prepare. And we'll talk about that in the Sparks here in just a second. But all that happens in one. You get a feel for who Mormon is at his core and where he began and that spiritual sensitivity that he has. Then you're going to go into two. So in chapter two, this is when you see Mormon just a little bit older. Now he's in his teenage years. He has this one-on-one -on -one connection with the Lord where he comes to really know the goodness of God. He tastes it. And then he wants to go and do good. So he seeks opportunities. I don't even know that he sought opportunities to lead as much as he just wanted to go about doing good. And when you're that kind of person, the world notices. And so the Nephites around Mormon, even though he's 16 years old, they ask him to be their leader, to be a military general, much like Captain Moroni, and to go and 
help them fight their enemies. And he tries. He diligently tries because he loves his people and he wants them to succeed. But oh, the, the road is rocky because the people won't repent. He pleads with them. In fact, when you go into Mormon 3, that's when you see him pleading with them to repent. He can see their Achilles heel, right? No matter what armor they put on or how strong they think they are, if they don't have the strength of the Lord, they will not succeed. And Mormon, even I think as a teenager, recognizes that. And so he pleads with them to repent. And they just simply won't. They won't turn. They have these little moments of temporary success. And then they think that that success is their own credit. And so they turn further and further away from God, which makes Mormon sorrow. And that kind of takes you into four. Because in four, you see that there is epic battles that are happening. Mormon, by the end of three, he's resigned. They're getting bloodthirsty and they're trying to avenge and turn on the offensive. And Mormon pulls back and says, I, I won't lead you this way. And so then he just has to watch. You got, to me, this is one of the hardest parts of his coming of age story. He has to watch as his people self-destruct. Yes, there are enemies that are fighting them, but they are causing this trouble to themselves because they refuse to turn back to God. And you see the brutality of war spike in these stories where there is aggression against women and children. They're being sacrificed to idols. It gets grisly and hard to read. In fact, you can almost hear Mormon lightening it for us so that we don't feel the weight of the heaviness that he feels. And that takes you back into five. So when you go into Mormon five, this is when he pivots a little bit. We're going to talk about this in the Sparks too, but Mormon's intent is to teach us in the latter days. I think because he tried to teach his people and be a prophet for them and none but his own family seemed to listen. And so at a certain point, he pivots and he speaks directly to us. And you'll get a feel for that in five. He returns to the Nephites. He tries to help, but it, there's there's limited options because they simply won't repent. And he just laments and then tries to speak to our generation. And then in Mormon 6, you get that final battle. This is the Hill Cumorah battle where hundreds of thousands perish in front of his eyes, where he tries to lead them and tries to help them. And he just has to watch in I would imagine is just absolute horror as they all perish. Men, women, children, they're swept down by enemies. And he's heartbroken. Literally, I think he's heartbroken for a bit because you hear his lament. It's deep and it's poignant and it's hard to read, but oh, it's good. That's what you find in six. So that kind of takes us to the end of that piece of the story. You'll get a little more from him next week. And then also some of his writings that his son Moroni captured and recorded for us. But you really get Mormon's whole story in this study. So it's worth every second you can give it. Okay, that's the summary. Now let's get into the sparks. Spark number one, I call birthright blessings. And a lot of it was prompted by what we heard in conference from Brother Wilcox. I loved his talk to the youth and his just verb, you know, his enthusiasm for trying to get the youth to rise up to the privileges that they've been given. I I loved his words, and I saw a lot of his message in Mormon's story. So where things start off is with Amaron. So we don't know much about Amaron. We just know he's the last one to hold the records and maintain the records. And remember last week, we studied him burying the records. And then in this chapter, in one, he encounters Mormon, and he sees who he is. And he gives Mormon this gift. What's impressive to me is he doesn't give Mormon the plates. He doesn't even tell him exactly when or how this is all going to shake out. He just says... Well, to me, it's a message of hope. Let me read you the verse and you can kind of evaluate for yourself. This is Mormon 1 verses 2 and 4. It says, And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about 10 years of age, and I began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child and art quick to observe. What I like about that beginning is Amaron sees potential in this 10-year-old Mormon. I'm sure that the Spirit is prompting Amron and guiding his steps, but I think it's powerful that Amron doesn't get in his own way. He trusts in the plan of God, and so he proceeds forward. Listen to what happens in 4. And behold, ye shall take the plates of Nephi unto yourself. This is Amron speaking to Mormon. And the remainder shall ye leave in the place where they are, and ye shall engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. He's 10. To, to get this kind of understanding about his future must have been a little staggering to Mormon. Even if he is a sober child, he's, he's living in a war-torn country. So I think kids in war-ravaged areas grow up really fast. So I'm sure that's 
a little bit of Mormon's backstory. But I also think what Emron really gives him in this moment, and really by extension, what the Lord gives him is hope. Because now all of a sudden, this 10-year-old kid who lives in a war-ravaged world believes he will make it. He knows he has a work for God to do. He knows that there is an important work that's, I mean, later you're going to learn that he's a direct descendant of Nephi. These are his ancestors' writings. I don't know if he would have been in line to receive this or not, but in this moment, this sacred ground, 10-year-old Mormon is given hope that not only is he going to make it through this war, but he is needed through this war and God will protect him. Something about hope and, and purpose and mission, that's what I feel like we have to teach the youth. We, when we teach them, it can't just be about you are a chosen generation and God couldn't wait to bring you to the earth. I think we have to teach them why, which is why I loved Brother Wilcox's words so much. Let me listen to a little bit of his talk. So this is called, Oh, Youth of a Noble Birthright. He said, Today, we are not talking about your birth, birth order in earthly families or Old Testament gender roles. We are talking about the inheritance you receive as a joint heir with Christ because of the covenant relationship you have chosen to enter with him and your father in heaven. Is it too much for God to expect you to live differently than his other children so that you can better lead and serve them? Now, when you consider blessings, both temporal and spiritual, that you've been given, does your birthright mean that you are better than others? No, but it does mean you're expected to help others be better. Does your birthright mean you are chosen? Yes. But you're not chosen to rule over others. You're chosen to serve them. Is your birthright evidence of God's love? Yes. But more important, it is evidence of his trust. It is one thing to be loved and another thing entirely to be trusted. I loved that line when he said it. And that's how I see this exchange with Amaron and Mormon. That Mormon in this moment, even though he is so young, knows he is trusted. He knows he will be helped and prepared. I don't know what Mormon's dad was like. Maybe he's like Abraham and he's coming from a hard family that had abandoned the covenant. I don't know what his backstory is. I just know in this moment when Amaron, as this wise guardian of the plates, trusts 10-year-old Mormon, Mormon grows. You know, like this is the kind of coming of age story I love to see because it's not just about the adversity that propels him to growth. It's about the opportunity and the trust and the hope that God has for the kind of man that Mormon will be. And it's a lot like what happens to our kids as they receive their patriarchal blessings. That's why I love that we've heard so many of those messages in the last few conferences about not holding back opportunities to receive a patriarchal blessing, going earlier maybe, so that your kids have this Mormon type experience where they realize that God has a plan for them. And not just in a general plan of salvation kind of plan, but a specific plan for them and a need for them in this work. I loved it. And I feel like it's what propels Mormon to make his own connection to God. This time with Amaron sets the stage. He's going to have 14 years to prepare for the time when he'll actually have the plates. And all that time he has this understanding. You know, just like Joseph Smith had before Moroni came, like he, he had this understanding from the first vision, but he didn't have the full story and he got it line upon line. And I imagine that happens with Mormon as well. And I love how it, how you see it develop in his coming of age story. So this is Mormon 1, 13 and 14. This is a little bit forward in the story. But wickedness did prevail on the face of the whole land, insomuch that the Lord did take away his beloved disciples and the work of miracles and of healing did cease because of the iniquity of the people. And there were no gifts from the Lord, and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of the wickedness, their wickedness and unbelief. And 15, and I being 15 years of age, being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord, and I tasted and I knew of the goodness of Jesus. I love that piece, the whole thing. I even like the hard that he describes, because I think that's what Brother Wilcox was teaching our youth as well. The youth that are struggling with, why do we have to live so different? Why do the standards have to be different? Why can't we just fit in and blend in with the world? I think this is what the Lord is trying to help Mormon understand. I want a connection with you. I want you to know me. I want you to taste the goodness. For me, that idea of tasting the goodness means you have a firsthand taste of what forgiveness feels like of what peace feels like, or the joy of redemption feels like. That's the taste, understanding that gift of redemption. Now he has tasted it, and that will help him. It will fuel everything that comes next. At this young age, he has tasted of the goodness of God, and now he's going to spend the rest of his life moving that ball forward and trying to get as many people as he can to come unto Christ, which is exactly what Brother Wilcox taught our youth.
So here's another snippet from his talk. He says, think of it. God trusts you. Of all the people on the earth, the children of the covenant, his crew members, to help with his work of bringing all his children safely to him. No wonder President Brigham Young once said, all the angels in heaven are looking at this little handful of people. What I liked about that piece, so just this week I was teaching my YSAs uh, about their divine heritage and their destiny and trying to like pump them up for how great they really are. And we were talking a little bit about this idea of how many people have been watching for this day to come. And sometimes I think all that talk about the rising generation and the chosen generation almost seems so commonplace that they forget who they are. And so what I tried to help them understand is what that means to me, if you're part of this rising chosen generation, this last dispensation of the fullness of times, and that's not just teenagers, that's my generation and the generation before me, this last dispensation that's been going on since the time of Joseph Smith, these are people who were coached in my brain. Well, at least what I told my YSA is, is I like to picture that game show, The Voice. You ever watch that one? You know where all the, they have these big fancy musicians and they're turned around backwards and they've got this big button. And then somebody goes behind their chair and sings and the coaches like buzz in when it's their turn and if they want somebody on their team. So I asked my YSA is like, if you were in the pre-existence and your voice was heard, what kind of coaches would have buzzed and been like, I want that one. I, I, I want that voice. Something about the chosen generation means that you were buzzed in to be here at this time and that you were coached. I think one of my favorite parts about studying the scriptures is thinking about all those men and women who came before us that were our coaches before we ever got here. You know, people like Eve and Ruth and Rebecca and so many others, the men and the women in scriptures who inspire me, maybe they were our coaches, you guys. Like, I just think this generation, and not just, I don't just mean the teenagers that are alive on the earth today. I mean our dispensation. We are intended to do great things, all of us, at different points in time and for different purposes. We are intended to do great things. And so we need to lift and inspire each other. We can't just pass the torch to the rising generation. We have to keep that flame going. I love the way Brother Wilcox said it. This is his last, one of his last thoughts. He said, O oh, youth of the noble birthright, carry on, carry on, carry on. I testify that you are loved and that you are trusted today, in 20 years, and forever. Don't sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. Don't trade everything for nothing. Don't let the world change you when you were born to change the world. I think that's the message of Amaron to Mormon, and it absolutely is the message from Mormon to us. He could see our day, and he pled with us to step up. And I think it's what our leaders are teaching us today as well. So hopefully you're here in both counts and you feel motivated to step up and move this ball forward. Spark number two, I call Mortality Works. And I bet you can guess which conference talk inspired this part of my study. I just love Mormon's tenacity. He just finds a way to stay steady despite everything going wrong. Even when he has these hopes, right? There are times when he has hope that the people are going to change again and the Lord gives him permission to teach and just, you know, call people to repentance. And he has this hope and then it gets dashed to pieces and somehow he stays steady. And it was interesting coming off the heels of last weekend. So last weekend I got to teach a big group of women in Bluffdale and it was young women and Relief Society sisters. And we had this great conversation about the plan of salvation because I really think one of the best tools to help you stay grounded is certainty. And not just certainty about a few things, but certainty about God's whole plan. Like I told you before, I really think when Mormon says he's tasted of the goodness of God, that's the goodness. The, the redeeming role of the Savior in Heavenly Father's magnificent plan is the goodness of the gospel. And he wants to share it with as many people as he can. And even when they don't listen, he seems to be okay. Here's When I was talking to the women in Bluffdale, I, I gave them President Nelson's message. So I'm going to start this quote. Just like the women that were in that meeting, they were able to finish it for me. That's how well we quote this quote from President Nelson. My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. Like I guarantee every one of you had that playing in your head. What I think is interesting is that we often don't quote that next part. The next paragraph, he talks about how, how you can do it. And these two things I think you see in Mormon's story. So the next paragraph says, when the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation and Jesus Christ and his gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. When I started really studying this, I found 
light bulbs going off. It was because I was prepping for that talk. And then I started to study Mormon's words and you can see it. The, the steadiness that Mormon has, it comes from his understanding of the plan of salvation. He knows God's plan. He trusts that mortality works no matter how messy mortality is. That's why I love that talk from Elder Hales at conference, because he gave stories of people whose lives were messy. You know, like, you remember the beginning of his talk, he was talking about this woman who had been divorced and had health issues all of her life and then was widowed for decades. And her life was messy, but it's her words that inspired the whole talk. That as she, in whatever form, gave an understanding to her son that her story worked. Let me give you his, his words. He said, nine months after her passing, one of her sons had a remarkable experience in the temple. He learned by the power of the Holy Ghost that his mother had a message for him. She communicated with him, but not by vision or audible words. The following unmistakable message came into the son's mind from his mother. I want you to know that mortality works. I want you to know that I now understand why everything happened in my life the way it did, and it is all okay. The message is all the more remarkable when one considers her situation and the difficulties this sister endured and overcame. I think that's what Mormon gets. It's what keeps him centered. He seems to understand that mortality will work. Look at this. This is Mormon 2, 18 and 19. He almost sounds, have you ever talked to a veteran and they don't want to give you all the details of war? Like they want to shield you from that because they love you and they want you to understand war, but they don't want you to know war. Mormon's a little bit like that. He's like that, you know, rugged vet that holds back a little bit, but he wants to tell you the story. So he says, there was this continual scene of wickedness and abominations before his eyes. And then he says, before my eyes that I had ever seen since I began to be sufficient, sorry, since ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man, meaning from his childhood to the, whenever he started to actually understand, he's seen blood and horror and war all of his days. This is 19. And woe is me because of their wickedness, for my heart has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness. All my days, nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. What acts as this life preserver for Mormon in this sea of hard is this faith in, not just in the Savior, but in the Savior's redeeming role, in this promise of the plan of salvation, in the promise that mortality will work, whether his armies ever come back to God or not, whether his family gets to stay with him or not, whether no matter what happens, no matter how many intersections of agency ram Mormon, I mean, think how many different experiences he had where other people's agency impacted him and his family. And he trusted over and over again that mortality works and that he doesn't need to be in control of all of those things. He can simply do his best to do the work that God asked him to do, and then trust that no matter what mess his life looks like on the surface, God can take every single piece and make it work together for his good. And not just his good, but our good. That's what Mormon understood. And when you have that kind of certainty, an understanding of the plan of salvation, and an understanding of the redeeming role of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Christ, how you access that power, then I feel like you can weather almost anything. It doesn't mean you won't sorrow. I think you see over and over again this week that there is great sorrow. Mormon wants the people to change. He, he, his heart is devastated to see the loss of people, especially almost like a waste of their lives, right? They had a chance to change course and they went headlong into the fire anyway. So there is sorrow in Mormon's life, but there is this buoyant hope and it all comes from his understanding of the plan of salvation. I just thought there were so many beautiful parallels between what he taught me and what I learned from Elder Hales. Let me read you a little bit more Mormon story. So this is Mormon 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, And it came to pass that the Lord, this is after there's been this, a 10-year treaty of peace. So it's not that everybody was getting along. He had to make a bargain with the Gadian robbers and the Lamanites. Like That must have been a very... Like, I'm sure he knew that that peace treaty was not going to last very long. It's probably just enough time for him to get the plates abridged. I imagine that's what happened in those 10 years. But he's granted this season of peace. And then he has this hope. So this is 2 and 3 of chapter 3. And it came to pass that the Lord did say unto me, Cry unto this people, Repent ye, and come unto me, and be ye baptized, and build up again my church, and ye shall be spared. I, If I got that revelation from the Lord, I would assume things are going to go great. You know, if I got that revelation from the Lord about my own kids or something, I would be like, oh, great. All my prayers worked. They're going to come around. It's good. You know, like I just, 
it must have been so hard to be Mormon and hope that this would change things and that the Lord was on your side. But then you see just one verse later how it goes. And I did cry unto this people, but it was in vain. And they did not realize that it was the Lord that had spared them. And they grant and that granted unto them a chance for repentance. And behold, they did harden their hearts against the Lord their, their God. I imagine this hurt Mormon, but it didn't devastate him. It didn't destroy his testimony because he has tasted of the goodness of God. He knows that fruit is real. He knows that the Lord loves his people, and he sees this as an olive branch going to his people. He sees the Lord's effort as another chance. But because he understands the plan of salvation, he understands agency, and he doesn't try to control it, and he doesn't let it dominate him. There are lots of circumstances in my life that are hard. Your life too. But we don't have to let them define us, because we can let this understanding of our covenant connection to God steady us in the storm. I have found that steadiness over and over again in my life. Whenever things get really hard, I try to put on a plan of salvation lens. President Worthen taught me this years ago, but this idea of like putting on a lens and looking through the plan of salvation and then looking at your life. And I'd be like, okay, I can see how Heavenly Father might pull this together for my good. He might make me a much more empathic person because of this hard thing. Or, you know, like if you just put on that lens, you can see a lot more clearly. And then it doesn't matter so much how messy your world gets or how hard the world, the greater world around us gets. You can have peace because you know who you are and that God is at the helm. This is Elder Hales. He said, because this life is a testing ground and dark clouds of trouble hang over us and threaten our peace to destroy, it's helpful to remember this counsel and promise found in Mosiah 23 relating to life's challenges. Nevertheless, whosoever puts his, his trust in the Lord, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. I think Mormon knew that to his core. He learned it, I think, from the hope in Amaron's eyes at age 10, from the Lord's eyes when he was 15, from the continual efforts he had every day to come unto Christ and taste of that goodness, not just when he was a teenager, but every day since then. That gave him that kind of certainty where he just could trust that there is hope. And if you put your trust in the Lord, you'll be lifted up to the last day. And everyone else will who chooses him. Mormon is not special in that regard. In fact, his whole message is one of everybody can come. Please come. That's his message. It, he just trusts that anyone who does will be lifted up and therefore he can maintain his hope and even maintain his optimism in the world around him. This is Elder Hales one more time. He said, God's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The experiences of mortality are part of the journey that allows us to grow and progress toward immortality and eternal life. We were not sent here to fail, but to succeed in God's plan for us. I think you get this message from Mormon too, that he, he seems to understand this piece, that he was not sent here to fail, even though it appears on the surface that his efforts to save his people or even save them in battle fail. He does not fail because God's plan cannot fail. God's individual plan for Mormon's exaltation, his immortality and eternal life, it cannot fail if Mormon stays tethered to those covenant connections that he has. This isn't in this week's study, but I, I love the way you hear it next week. So this is in Moroni, his son's writings of Mormon. So Moroni captures some of his dad's letters, and he's going to add them to the Book of Mormon here in just a few weeks. But this comes from Moroni chapter 8, 16 and 17. This is just a hint of Mormon's character now that he's been through all of this hard, and he's had that centering of the, from the plan of salvation and the doctrine of Christ. Mormon 8, 16 and 17. This is just a snippet of it. He said, Behold, I speak with boldness, having authority from God, and I fear not what man can do, for perfect love casteth out all fear, and I am filled with charity, which is everlasting love. The fact that Mormon, at the end of his life, can be filled with charity, that he can look at this dark world, not just of the Lamanites that are their enemies, but the Nephites who have turned against God and rejected every word that Mormon tried to offer and made the mess that they're in, that he can have a heart full of charity tells me he understands the plan of salvation and he understands the doctrine of Christ. That kind of centering will hold you. It's definitely held me in hard times and I think it will always hold you if you choose to lean into it and trust in the will of God. Spark number three, I call a father's eyes because I love how Mormon chooses to remember his people. Despite all evidence around him, he calls them fair ones. Listen to his lament. This is at the very end of this week's study in chapter 6. This is verse 16 and 17. 
and my soul was rent with anguish. Rent is torn, right? It's shredded almost. His soul is torn because of the pain he feels. My soul was rent with anguish because of the slain of my people, and I cried. O oh, ye fair ones, how could you have departed from the ways of the Lord? O oh, ye fair ones, how could you have rejected that Jesus who stood with open arms to receive you? It just sounds so familiar, right? It's like what we studied in the New Testament when Savior wishes he could gather his chicks under his wings. He, you know, he just hopes and prays that he can heal them and help them and they reject. But what I love is that Mormon calls them fair ones. And I don't think this is anything about what is on the surface. I think this is who they are at their core. Mormon, because he's learned to taste of the goodness of God, and he started to see people the way God sees them. He sees them as fair, always. I think that's how the Savior sees every one of us, as fair ones. People who, if, if the messy world wasn't around us, we would be gleaming. But because we're in this fallen world, and we are mortal, and we make all kinds of mistakes, he sees us as wounded and in need of healing. In fact, that's what I love. If you go in the Isaiah, back in the Old Testament, I love the way Isaiah phrases it. This is Isaiah 1, verses 5 and 6. He says, he's like looking out over the children of Israel and says, Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. I think what Isaiah is trying to capture here is that visual of those who are sin sick. They've departed so far from the covenant that they are wounded head to toe, and they don't even realize the damage that's been done and the healing that is right there. I mean, that's what Mormon's trying to say to them. Like, how could you reject Jesus who stood right here with open arms to receive you? How could you turn away from him? And it just hurts his heart, but he sees them gleaming. I just think that's something so beautiful about the nature of Jesus Christ, that he is willing to be that filter. This week I was teaching the kids in my YSA class about, there's this beautiful article, if you haven't read it yet, it's from Elder Holland, and it's all about the garment of the Holy Priesthood, and it has great imagery in it. It talks about the veil being a representation of Jesus Christ. And I love that visual of our Father in Heaven seeing us through the veil of Jesus Christ, that he sees us with that filter, almost, you know, the same way an Instagram filter might make you look 10 years younger or something. The, the Father sees you through Jesus Christ. It is this gift that he sees you this way, because he never sees you as anything less than a fair one. He, he, he wants you to turn to the Savior so that you can be cleansed, you can be healed, you can be helped, and then you can return, because he sees you as fair always. He's got Father's eyes. In fact, what it reminded me of is, Jason's grandma. So she, he has this grandma named Bernice. She passed away several years ago, but I can still remember when we were newlyweds, we came to her house. She loved to feed us. She gave us so much food every time we went to her house. And she always, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think she loved Jason the most. Maybe all of her grandkids felt like she loved them the most, but Jason had a special place in Bernice's heart. And so when he would come over, she would just light up. And I can remember we were trying to get a job. It was like, he was just figuring out school and trying to find, you know, like our first job. And what she said to him, she was like, Jason, don't you forget that none of them deserve you. And I just laughed, right? Because he's, when we were kids, we had no qualifications, no real skills. We didn't deserve anything. But that's not how Bernice saw Jason. She saw him as a fair one. She saw him the same way she'd seen him from day one when he was born. And he was this beautiful soul that deserved every happiness. And no matter what, Jason did. She couldn't see him any other way. And I feel like that's how the Lord sees us. He sees you as fair ones always. And he sees you with wounds. And they're two separate things. Like he, you are not marred in his eyes because of your wound. You're, you need help. And he offers it to you freely. I just thought it was a beautiful thing to see how Mormon chooses to see. Because he, he could have been so bitter. I mean, think of his life and how hard it must have been. I don't know. I know his son Moroni makes it. I don't know if he had other children that didn't, if he has a wife somewhere who was lost, maybe they were sacrificed on the altars like other women and children were. He had every reason to be bitter. He had every reason to be angry at the world around him or even angry at God, and he never was because he chose to see his people as fair. He saw them through the lens, that filter of Jesus Christ. And when you look through Jesus Christ, you can see fairness. There is beauty and there's hope in every person if they will simply allow him to heal them. This is his, these are more of his words. This is Mormon 6, 18, 19, and 20. 
But behold, if ye had not done this, ye would not have fallen. But behold, ye are fallen, and I mourn your loss. O ye fair sons and daughters, ye fathers and mothers, ye husbands and wives, ye fair ones, how is it that ye could have fallen? But behold, ye are gone, and my sorrows cannot bring you return. It's almost like, I mean, I hate to put it in these light words, but he's almost like a basketball player that's trying to send an inbound pass. He's got this goodness, this this goodness that he's tasted, and he wants to send it in. And every player on the court is looking another direction or has sat down on the sideline. Like he, he's just trying to send this pass in. And because no one there will accept that pass and they all are destroyed, he has to send the ball to us. That, that's what he does. He says, okay, will you look? That's the most powerful part of this week's study for me is when I felt Mormon passing me ball saying, Maria, will you look? My people wouldn't look up. My people wouldn't turn to the Lord to heal their wounds. You're wounded too. Will you look up? Will you catch this path? And he does it over and over again in in his writings. So he says in five, this is 22 through 24. Oh, then, oh, and then, oh, you Gentiles, how can you stand before the power of God except you, you shall repent and turn from your evil ways? This is him speaking to us, speaking to this last dispensation. Know ye not that you are in the hands of God? Know ye not that he hath all power and that at his great command the earth shall be rolled up together as a scroll? Therefore, repent ye and humble yourselves before him. If we want to catch this goodness, if we want to taste for ourselves the goodness of God that he can taste, we have to catch his pass. We have to take these words and we have to run with them. I think that's what President Nelson was trying to help us understand as well. Over and over again, he speaks about the joy of repentance, this process of choosing to catch the ball, to let ourselves be changed by the goodness of God, and then to go forward, you know, to do more. Here's how he said it in this last conference. He sees us, I think, with Father's eyes as well. He always sees the people of God as fair ones, even though we're all riddled with wounds and working on things. This is how a prophet sees his people. Jesus Christ took upon himself your sins, your pains, your heartaches, and your infirmities. You do not have to bear them alone. He will forgive you as you repent. He will bless you with what you need. He will heal your wounded soul. As you yoke yourself to him, your burdens will feel lighter. If you will make and keep covenants to follow Jesus Christ, you will find that the painful moments of your life are temporary. Your afflictions will be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Isn't it beautiful to hear harmony between prophets? A prophet in our dispensation and this prophet Mormon and every prophet he abridged, they all have the same message. Come unto Christ and be perfected in him. Let him show you the wounds and then have the guts to turn to him and say, I don't want this anymore. And then watch what he can do next. Watch where he takes you next. I felt like that was President Nelson's invitation. He sees us with fair eyes, just like my dad sees me and Grandma Bernice sees Jason. That's how they view you. And so we should step into that role and embrace it. It's really tempting to slide some more sparks in here. There's no time, you guys. I got things I have to do tonight. So you're going to have to hold on with three and then join me for the live maybe and we'll catch up on some other ones. But now it's time to get into the questions. So these, again, are just conversation starting questions, things for you to ponder or chat about. Hopefully create good conversations among the people around you so that you all get into your scriptures. Okay, question one comes from the very first verse, right out of the gate. Mormon 1, verse 1. This is when Mormon says, And now I, Mormon, make a record of things which I have both seen and heard, and I call it the Book of Mormon. This is his book, like the little Book of Mormon inside the greater Book of Mormon. My question to you is simple. This is Mormon finally giving us his words. And so he's going to tell us what he has seen and what he has heard. After all this time and all he's abridged, he has to cherry pick what is the most important to capture. It's interesting to layer that on top of everything else you're going to study this week. But here's my question. If you had to make a record of your life so far, what would what would make the cut? Like, What would you include? What things have you seen and heard that you know would help the next generation or any who would read your words step up. That's Mormon to me. Everything he taught us is so that we could witness where the road goes if we turn away from Christ and where the road of certainty leads if we choose to follow him. So what would be on your list? What would make the cut? Okay, question number two. This is from Mormon 3 verse 16. This is an interesting part because this is when Mormon steps away from the war. There's a few different places where you can tell that being a military leader of a wicked people. I actually think he talks about how much he loves them, that he loves them for who they are. I think these these people have noble hearts and they want to do good, but they are riddled with sin and they turn away from God and they boast in their own winnings. And Mormon just can't 
he can't be that. You know, there comes a point when Zion and Babylon just, he can't. So he chooses to depart. But then he talks about being an idol witness. He says he has to stay. And my question is, have you ever had this experience? I think it's interesting that Mormon doesn't get to leave the land. I would think if you had a prophet of God and his family, and there was this people that were self-destructing, essentially, both the Nephites and the Lamanites at this point are kind of coming to battle with each other. In fact, in the verses this week, he's going to talk about how the wicked punish the wicked, and he doesn't even really need to cause destruction because they do it to themselves. But you would almost think that the Lord would take this little family and move them elsewhere and then bring them back later once the destruction has happened. But for some reason, Mormon has to witness it. He has to be an idol witness so that we can know. And my question is this, have you ever had to do that? Have you ever felt spiritually prompted to be an idol witness? where you saw maybe it was a loved one of yours, or I don't know what circumstances there were, but there have been times in my life when I have felt the Spirit restrain me, where I have to just let the cards fall. And that's hard. And I wondered what your experience is like. So have you had this experience of being an idol witness? Have you had to stand by and watch destruction ever? And if you did, how did it broaden your understanding of the character of God? or maybe of agency or the plan of salvation? What did you glean from it that helped you carry forward? Okay, question number three. This comes from Mormon 5 verse 1. This is when Mormon talks about repenting of the oath. Uh, I don't think Mormon did anything wrong. He had made an oath that he was not going to go lead the people, especially not when they were, uh, you know, had this vengeance in their heart. He wasn't going to lead them anymore. And then later he changes his mind. And it says he repents of the oath, which to me just means because he'd made an oath with God, he turns to God and says, I think I want to change course. Is this okay with you? I, to me, that's what that means. It means he wants to make sure that he and God are still on the same page and God grants him the ability to change course and go and lead the people again. And I want to know what you think motivates this change in Mormon's heart. Why does he get back into the fight? Why does he lead his people, especially knowing what he knows as a prophet about their ultimate destruction? Why does he change and lead them again. Is it about, I read some opinions about it being defensive warfare versus offensive warfare, maybe. I also wonder if it has something to do with what's happening with women and children being sacrificed. We know that Mormon has a very sensitive heart for that. Later, we're going to read about that in his writings that Moroni captures. I wonder if there's a piece of it that's there, but I, I don't know. What do you think changes Mormon's heart? Why does he get back in the fight, especially at this point in the battle? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can either leave them on the YouTube thread, like in the comments, or if you're in the course, I hope you'll leave them on the insights lesson so that we can all sort of chat about it, maybe bring it up in the live and see what we can learn. We're going to head into the object lessons next, but I'm going to leave you with one last little quote from Elder Pace. This comes from his 1990 address a thousand times. He was talking about Mormon and his perspective on Mormon. I just loved it. It's light and optimistic and bright to me. And I'm always seeking out joy. This is a gospel of joy, right? So I feel like you can even read Mormon 1 through 6 and seek out joy. And I feel like Elder Pace directed me towards it. These are his words. He said, the great prophet Mormon set another example worthy of emulation. He lived at a time that was hopeless. Imagine this, there were no gifts from the Lord. The Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of their wickedness and unbelief. In spite of this hopeless situation, Mormon led their armies. For in his words, Notwithstanding their wickedness, I loved them according to the love of God that was in me with all my heart. And my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. And then this is back to Elder Pace's words. This prophet had Christ-like love for a fallen people. Can we be content with loving less? We must press forward with a pure love of Christ to spread the good news of the gospel as we do so and fight the war of good against evil, light against darkness, and truth against falsehood. We must not neglect our responsibility of dressing the wounds of those who have fallen in battle. There is no room in the kingdom for fatalism. This message of Mormon is one of hope. It's one of buoyancy. It's one of, he's trying to give you a lifeline to hold on to. And for me, especially when you read more of Elder Pace's words, his his thoughts about how we can do this and how you can't turn on those who are fallen, how you have to love more those who are falling around you. Mormons are an example of that. And if I could direct you to any talk, it's in the notes, so you can go find it in the notes, but go listen to Elder Pace's commentary on it and then read Mormon's words. And I promise new things will come to the surface.